Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Jonathan Simons, and I'm the president and chief executive officer of the Prostate Cancer Foundation. It's a real pl privilege to be chairing this session, which is entitled Immunotherapy, the Silver Bullet Against Cancer. Um, you okay for audio? Great. Um, the, this session's uh, being supported by the philanthropy of Lil Milken. And this session, we hope, will leave everyone with an entirely different view of cancer research, uh, unless you've been studying immunotherapy actively, either as a physician scientist, a PhD scientist, a patient being treated, a family of a patient being treated, or um, what we call at the Prostate Cancer Foundation citizen scientists like Lowell Milken, Michael Milken, and a number of people in the room who really care about accelerating um, biomedical research for patients. Our uh, panelists for this session are, you can hit the slides please, um, they have a gust amount of information which I won't read out to you, but this is uh, Pam Sharma from MD Anderson. She's one of the leading physician scientists in immunotherapy research, um, and we'll be um, talking a lot about her research um, to citizens. Our next panelist is uh, Jed Wolchuk from Memorial Sloan Kettering, who also directs the melanoma research program there. Um, and Dr. Wolchuk has a laboratory, has a research nurse, he has a regular nurse, mm -hmm. and um, like everyone on this panel actually, mm -hmm. doesn't sleep very much, um, <laughs> but is actually at the sleep. forefront of um, mm -hmm. a lot of this work. On our next slide, we have Dr. Charles Drake, um, who's a physician scientist, oncologist scientist, who works on how the immune system can attack not just melanoma, but cancers that traditionally we haven't thought would even respond to immunotherapy, cancers like the prostate cancer, lung cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer. And we have uh, Elliot Siegel, um, who has um, the privilege, like I do, to be board members on the Melanoma Research Alliance, founded by Leon and Deborah Black. He's a former chief science officer of Bristol Myers Squibb. If it weren't for Elliot and a handful of uh, people, there would really not be your voice. Mm -hmm. It's fair to say, although he'll be somewhat shy <laughs> about um, talking about the challenges of running a company like Bristol Myers Squibb and I'm um, dealing with incongruous early data, but we'll try to take that story and put it out there because we're going to need a lot of courageous leadership, not just in government and not just with foundations, but in biopharma and at the FDA and all the rest. And all of us have something in common. We all went to medical school uh, to do research to end death and suffering from patients. And it's a real privilege for me because the when Michael Milken was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer, the Prostate Cancer Foundation started taking bets that the immune system someday could be involved in treating prostate cancer. We have two PCF young investigators. All of us have been involved with the Melanoma Research Alliance. You'll hear more about that. But it was really my team at Hopkins that demonstrated that T cells um, could circulate and attack prostate cancer, break tolerance. We did this work in the late 90s without the tools that we're going to talk about today, fair chuck. But it was unequivocal by the turn of this century that the last cancer on the list of 300 cancers that take the lives of people that anyone would have thought could have an immune response had been proven to be tractable to T cells, fair chuck. So we all share this um, a common bond. The ultimate common bond is what we could do with the science for patients. So now if you could please roll this uh, video, you're going to get Immunotherapy 101 in 2014 for cancer. For most of human history, we have stood helpless in the war against cancer. That's because our immune system hasn't been able to effectively recognize, mobilize, and attack cancer the way it should until now.
really for the first time with quite significant precision we can turn on the immune system in the context of cancer and we've seen some very dramatic examples of both disease control as well as complete remissions. It is a breakthrough more than a hundred years in the making. In the 1890s, Dr. William Coley achieved some success by injecting bacteria directly into the tumors of his cancer patients. But his results were unpredictable, and radiation and chemotherapy soon became the norm. By the 1950s, immunologists had discovered that special white blood cells, called T cells, were the system's foot soldiers on constant patrol to identify and eliminate enemy invaders. Cancer cells, however, cloak themselves in a molecule called CTLA-4 to escape detection. In 1996, Jim Allison found a way to block this cloaking action and allow T cells to go on the attack against cancer. If we do this right, we ought to be able to not only cure cancer, but do it with a minimum of collateral damage, if you will, of, of, of side effects to normal tissues. Allison's work resulted in a drug called ipilimumab, or Yervoy, which was approved by the FDA in 2011. The drug actually cures an astounding 20% of all patients with terminal melanoma, and we're just beginning to discover how effective it can be with other cancers. Another one of these promising so-called checkpoint inhibitor drugs is anti-PD-1. The drug is fairly simple drug to mix. Uh, we reconstitute the drug uh, because it comes in a powder and we mix that with saline in an infusion bag. This batch of anti-PD-1 will be given to T.J. Sharp, who has just arrived at Holy Cross Hospital in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, with his wife, Jen. Battling stage 4 melanoma, T.J. receives infusions of anti-PD-1 every three weeks as part of a clinical trial. I had tumors in my abdomen, liver, spleen, and both lungs. Uh, and the prognosis from the oncologist at Broward General was, he'll be lucky to be here in two years. The thing that gives me hope is that there are others that have come before me that are doing well on immunotherapies. I see survivor stories and they certainly buoy my spirits and say, you know, one day that can be me. That's going to be me. Come here. Ah. Since I started my clinical trial, I've gained a lot of my strength back, a lot of the weight back. I've become much more active. Just last weekend, I was able to run a five mile charity run with both children in the stroller. And if you would have told that oncologist a year and a half ago that I'd be running five miles pushing both children, I think you'd be pretty surprised. Another form of immunotherapy involves extracting from a patient another kind of white blood cell called dendritic cells. When these are exposed to extracted tumor cells in the lab and then reintroduced to the patient, it gives T cells an exact picture of what the enemy looks like. That is the principle behind the vaccine that Keith Black developed to combat glioblastoma multiforme, the most common and lethal brain tumor. For glioblastoma, the median survival uh, is about 15 to 18 months. Uh, you know, less than you know, five to eight percent of patients are alive out past five years. It was terrifying. Uh, the first thing that occurred to me was, I won't see my children graduate from college. I won't see grandchildren. I'll, I won't see my husband anymore. It was a scary thought that I have no way of stopping it. After Dr. Black removed her tumor, Mary underwent chemotherapy and radiation, followed by a clinical trial with Dr. Black's immunotherapeutic vaccine. This was to try to prevent any recurrence of the disease that normally comes roaring back within months. She completed a clinical trial with the vaccines in 2007, uh, and she's been disease-free since, so seven years since her last vaccine therapy. I feel good. You're using your own body to strengthen yourself. It's absolutely amazing. Boom. All right. <laughs> For cancer patients, their families, and their doctors, immunotherapy is a revelation and a revolution, holding out the hope that treatments such as chemotherapy may someday be obsolete.
For when we can consistently mobilize our own body to do what is necessary to recognize and defeat this ancient and formidable enemy, we will look back on these recent breakthroughs and say this was the turning point in the war on cancer. Thank you. Um, Jed, the, the word revolution has been used about your voy. And could we just hit the slide uh, with the Science Magazine, which is Breakthrough of the Year. Every scientist on the earth, if you want to bring up the, there you go. Jed, the word revolution has been used for your voy, nipilimumab, and melanoma. Is that the right word? And if it is, why? It is the right word. Um, it represents a fundamental change in the way we think about immunotherapy for melanoma and how we think about immunotherapy for cancer. Um, because it is a medicine that any oncologist can prescribe, that any oncologist can give in their office in the outpatient setting, and that has the possibility to confer many years of life extension um, to patients regardless of whether their tumor has a specific mutation or not. Um, it really is a revolution, and I would call it a revolution of hope uh, because it actually allows us to change the tenor of the conversations that we have with patients who are newly diagnosed with what was formerly a, a fairly uniformly fatal illness. We now can say to them, there's something that is available to you outside of a clinical trial that some people seven years ago received as part of a trial four doses of this medicine once every three weeks and they are fine today. When, um, how many, first of all, how many melanoma patients who are, would have been terminally ill in 2012 if they all got Uruvoy? Uh, how many lives a year would be saved? I would say somewhere between 15 and 1,700 lives would be saved if every eligible patient received that medicine. Okay. And the percentage of, if you had 100 patients like that, right, that still means that 80 out of 100 or another two or 3,000 melanoma patients, the medicine uh, doesn't work, correct? It's actually, it's, it's quite a bit more than that that it doesn't work. It's about 20% where it does work. Um, and when we define work, we mean patients who are alive for three years or longer, which um, this 20% number may, may seem small, but this is a disease that before this medicine, the median life expectancy was seven to eight months. And now we're talking about 20% of people being alive for three years plus. And we didn't stop counting at three years because all of a sudden people died at three years. That's just the length of the follow-up we have so far. There are people who are out more than 10 years. I think. Uh, the first person that, that Dr. Allison talks about meeting who was treated with anti-CTLA-4 uh, over 10 years ago is still alive and well. Um, Pam, doing this research supported by the Melanoma Research Alliance um, at MD Anderson has been a cultural change, right? Mm -hmm. Because if I understand it correctly, um, a number of these patients are told their immune systems will fight their cancer for the rest of their lives. Yes. Is that right? What have we learned in the last 12, let's say, to 24 months? Because the research community was starting to see these patients come back who never came back before, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, there were a lot of happy emails. But thinking about uh, melanoma and the bigger picture to MD Anderson about how to start to extend this research into other cancers, what's at the forefront of research now based on these findings? So I think, you know, melanoma set the stage for us because we finally had a large cohort of patients that you could study and say, these patients are responding, these patients are not. We did not have that previously. And I think immunotherapy in this setting where we've figured out that we can block an inhibitory pathway, which is what CTLA-4 is, and allow the immune system to take off, that allowed us to then start thinking, what are the other inhibitory pathways? What are the other um, 
checkpoints, as we call it, that needs to be blocked. And if we can study the melanoma patients and say, look, we're seeing the same checkpoints in prostate cancer, in lung cancer, in pancreatic cancer, then how do we take that information and build it out so that those other patients are getting treatment with these immunotherapy agents and benefiting? So at MD Anderson, we've set up what's known as the immunotherapy platform, where clinical trials are across all the departments with immunotherapy agents. So the same immunotherapy agents we started with in melanoma, we're now using in pancreatic cancer, in gastric cancer, in small cell lung cancer. We're taking the lessons we've learned and we're building on them to really help more and more patients because these agents are treating your immune system. They're not treating the tumor cells. And if we all have the same immune system, then we should be able to drive that immune response against any tumor type. Chuck, you work at the forefront, having collaborated with Dr. Allison and others, uh, Pam. But you look at your 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 laboratory is also fascinated and dedicated to solving the cure of cancers that are not traditionally thought to be um, uh, treatable, let alone curable, with um, T cells and B cells. Uh, what have you learned, and how are you applying it um, to these other cancers? And why don't you tell the audience a little, a little bit about your program? Well, it's, it's fascinating, actually. So we have a laboratory where we study um, the immune response to tumors in mice, and also I take care, like all these folks, uh, of cancer patients in the clinic. And, and I'm really fortunate to have treated some patients, uh, some of the early kidney cancer patients with anti-PD-1, nivolumab. And we're starting to see some of the same long-term responses that, that Jed was talking about in melanoma. I have a patient in my clinic who's now five years out from his last treatment, and he turned out to be the... Uh, first patient with kidney cancer ever treated with nivolumab. So on this one side, we have these about 30% response rate to nivolumab, anti-PD-1, as a single agent in advanced kidney cancer. It's really amazing. And uh, again, I have many patients in my clinic who are doing well three and five years out. But on the other hand, we look at prostate cancer, which uh, single agent checkpoint blockade does have some efficacy. Um, there are some responses to anti-CTLA-4 in prostate cancer, but we didn't see any to PD-1, and that's what absolutely fascinates me. So what we're doing now, actually, is we're studying really carefully the, the, the soldiers, the immune cells that infiltrate prostate cancers to try to figure out why they're not responding to these agents like nivolumab, and, and not as well to CTLA-4 as we would like to see, as we see in melanoma. And, it's, and these are all uh, tumors, tumor types, where traditional chemotherapy of the 20th century, unfortunately, while it can help some, many patients, cure some patients, don't work at all, correct? Correct, these are all tumors that, and actually all patients with metastatic uh, treatment refractory disease, even the ones who have had complete responses to the volume of. So are some of your patients, Pam, saying um, to you, is this the end of chemo? Have, you, have, have patients started to actually have that observation? So it's interesting because now the patients in my clinic are even refusing the chemotherapy, which is standard of care. They just want immunotherapy. They don't even want the chemotherapy. So now the clinical trials have to be written in such a way that if your patient refuses chemotherapy, then they're eligible to participate in the clinical trial as long as the patients document that they really do not want chemotherapy. We had to put that in there because there were so many patients who were saying, forget the chemo, I just want the immunotherapy drug. And before, most clinical trials were written to say you have to have failed chemotherapy and then you can go on to an experimental clinical trial. Well, these patients don't see it that way. They don't see immunotherapy as experimental. They are hearing all the responses and they want to be on those drugs. So we're having to find ways of allowing them to participate in the clinical trials. And I do think this is an important time to pay attention to the patients and their needs. And we have to be their best advocates when we write these trials. One of the <clears throat> best patient advocates um, was either in Wallingford or Princeton at the time, who um, either got an email or a memo, and his name was Dr. Elliot Siegel, and there was this discussion about uh, a molecule called anti-CTLA-4. And um, Dr. Siegel was actually some, not just somewhat responsible, he led the team um, that actually ultimately developed the drug. Elliot will be somewhat cautious probably. I may take some editorial liberty, but Elliot, tell us what it was like um, to bring in the anti-CTLA pro program, and why don't you tell the audience a little bit about the courage of letting actually research take place rather than have the business development people 
try to shut things down too soon. <laughs> uh, fortunately, I'm retired, so I can handle that question. Now, actually, everybody was <clears throat> quite supportive. And I'd like to say, first of all, because it's important for the audience to know that drugs are developed in an ecosystem with contributions from a variety of groups. Uh, and this is a wonderful story of the contribution of NIH-supported funding, academic investigations, uh, biotech innovation, big pharma uh, participation um, where it's added uh, tremendous value, and patient groups like the Melanoma Research Alliance. And patients right now have more power than ever before, and there are very effective groups that are altering uh, the course of research and policy, which is, which is very important. Uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb scientists had been studying basic T cell biology for many years, both to turn it off for rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory disease, or, to, or possibly to turn it on. This was a difficult concept at first for all of us uh, to fight cancer. Uh, and CTLA-4 actually is administered as a drug for rheumatoid arthritis now under the name of Orencia, and that was one of our first approvals in this area. And as was noted, Jim Allison and other scientists uh, corrected the notion of what CTLA-4 as a was as a down regulator, and blocking CTLA-4 would unleash the immune system he proposed uh, against cancer. Uh, and some of scientists in biotech, Alan Corman and Niels Lonberg, for example, uh, championed this for many, many years and became a part of Metarex, which was a biotech company that advanced it and had the courage to advance it. In 2004, uh, it was proposed to me and others to combine forces of our science and biology on CTLA-4 with this biotech company, Metarex. Uh, even though this was hotly debated, um, in the academic circles. Um, so the leading cancer scientists at our leading NCI designated cancer centers were not of one mind this was a really good idea. Well, I, I was heavily criticized uh, for, uh, <laughs> for having uh, uh, maybe too much be uh, betting and too much investment in immuno-oncology. Um, but uh, I've made uh, mistakes. Uh, and fortunately, I've made some good decisions. Uh, this, as a portfolio, of opportunity, feeling that the need was there and the science made sense, uh, was a good decision to advance and to evaluate the data. So to do so collaboratively was essential, and to do so with a biotech company that had a compound in early clinical trials and a network of fantastic investigators, some of whom you see here, uh, was a good decision. Uh, but it was untrodden ground, and actually we were neck and neck with, with other groups. Who uh, are the, later, what was the other group? Well, <laughs> it's well I'm still in the community, so. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's important because changing culture yeah. is a part of what this conference is about, what, by what education. I, what, I'd like, what I would say is that, and, and the other group, it's, it's public, was, was Pfizer, uh, who's, uh, which has done some wonderful, wonderful things. But in this particular area, the separation here was, although we were both interested in an unmet medical need, um, the paradigm that we had to follow, and you have to follow in clinical science, is, is to follow the basic science and to follow the clinical intuition of the people on the front lines. And uh, what was happening was this, obvious, uh, this, this medicine has side effects, and it also seems to make the tumor worse before it gets better. And this is counterintuitive to people treating cancer. Once something you're administering is experiencing a growth of a tumor, you usually stop. And that was, that was the reflex. But the clinical design, uh, the investigators involved, and the paradigm to follow the science and expect tumors to get worse, perhaps before they get better, and therefore to wait out a long study with overall survival, which is what we did, uh, was, was the right thing to do here. One last question, Elliot, and we'll come back. There was a moment in time where by letting the investigators investigate, in other words, not killing off the program, but you were very polite. Yeah. Um, there was a moment in time where it had to be signal over noise or something had changed. And we've seen this before in medical research. What was that? Well, what impressed, what was that me, what impressed what was me was, yeah. was a clinical investigator inside the company um, 
Elliot Levy, who I had assigned to look at all our external opportunities. And he pointed out that even though this signal might be small and we weren't sure we could capture it in a phase three study, the durability of response was unbelievable and never seen before. And this was a condition, as you mentioned, for which there was no available therapy. Um, but despite that, we weren't sure that the phase three studies would be positive. And there was a lot of question about whether that would occur. And uh, I will say, um, basically to understand the inertia at initially to get into this field, this was so counterintuitive that the agency, the FDA, uh, which is very good about advancing medicines quickly now for patients, uh, wanted to see two survival curves. Now, two survival curves in a deadly cancer that has no alternative is a big ask, okay. especially when they take four or five years each. But that was where we were uh, in before 2011 in this field. Uh, what has changed is not just your VOI, but the compounds that are coming behind, the anti-PD-1s in particular, and the fact that we're now migrating out of the so-called immunogenic tumors, which classically was kidney and melanoma. Can Once just, this started to you work... You need to translate immunogenic. Not everybody's Latin's that good. Well, <laughs> the... the uh, uh, it, it was felt that some cancers would be sensitive to agents that modulate the immune system. Never before in melanoma have any of these agents shown an improvement in survival. Immunotherapy through blocking of, anti, uh, blocking of CTLA-4 did show that. Anti-PD-1 seems to show a much greater response the, and, and a durability that's now being evaluated in survival studies. Uh, but the fact that PD-1 is working and and, and similar agents are working in lung cancer, which was never thought to be responsive to modulation of the immune system, was the big aha that I think the whole community is pivoting around. And we are now living in what I think is a tsunami of disruptive change in the field of oncology research and therapy. Well, Don Coffey, our mentor, loved the tsunami art in, Ch in Japan, right? He just would put your, is a stick figure at the top, you had to surf it in to get your grants at Johns Hopkins to make a difference. So Chuck, how many, in the tsunami that's clearly happened, at least in a lot of oncology thinking, um, what, t how, how many lung cancer patients do you think right now cautiously, and we won't, more of the studies coming in, who no one in the 20th century would have thought could have responded to these medicines coming out of the Melanoma Research Alliance, Bristol-Myers Squibb, the NCI early investment, melanoma as the sort of emperor and empress of not just malady, but how to solve chemotherapy, refractory cancer treatment, you know. How many, roughly, what would you, what would you estimate right now from the data you've seen and know and what you see at Hopkins, how many, how many lung cancer patients should be starting to really be asking this question? It's, it's huge, actually. So if you consider maybe around just ballpark, 200,000 cases per year and about a 20% response rate to nivolumab, that's 40,000 patients. Even if only half of those are durable, that's 20,000 patients who will be alive two, three years from starting therapy who would not otherwise be alive. It's, it's actually transformative. And I think, I think Elliot really put it nicely. And in the beginning, you asked Jed what was revolutionary. And you know, Jed pointed out quite nicely to the idea of long-term responses off treatment. So, so many of these patients, actually, we should point out, the patients on PD-1 have completed their courses of treatment and have responses going off treatment, actually. So I think that's the other part, to me, that was revolutionary. And again, seeing patients who have their tumors either stay in, in remission or continue to have a complete response off treatment. Uh, Jed, the, um, um, we have 80 percent, let's say, it's going to be higher looking at data that's not published. But if melanoma is the, the way forward for brain tumors, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, which neutrally um, is pretty far behind where it will need to be in terms of this kind of research, just looking at where things are today. Um, tell us about what needs to be done for the 80% of melanoma patients that paves the way for all cancer patients. What, what's the scientific agenda for those patients? 
Before I do that, um, <laughs> I, I wanted to just pick up on a word that, that somebody used before, which is disruptive. Um, and sure. I think that, that this really is, this is the disruptive technology of, of cancer treatment. Um, because it takes us 180 degrees away from treating the cancer and to focus on treating the person. Um, and I think that's where the durability comes from. Uh, because we're, we're enlisting this dynamic organ, the immune system, to try to protect what's been achieved um, in a durable, memorable way, the same way that when you get vaccinated, uh, you know, as a baby, your immune system remembers those vaccines for a long time. And so one of the things that, that we've begun to look at um, is what happens to the immune system after you give the patient ipilimumab in melanoma. And one of the things we found is that there's another molecule, another immune checkpoint um, called PD-1, which several people have referred to, that gets upregulated on their T cells. It's sort of like the second line of defense that the T cell uses to prevent this state of overactivation that the immune system is trying desperately to avoid because our bodies are trained to have an in-control immune system so we don't get autoimmune disease. And so the next logical step was to block PD-1 and CTLA-4 at the same time. And so we did a phase one trial um, and actually uh, are studying patient responses in that clinical trial along with colleagues at BMS and, and through support from the MRA. And what we've learned actually is that up to 65% of patients treated with the combination can have their disease at least stop growing and somewhere between 15 and 20 percent will have complete remissions, everything going away, and actual regressions in 50 percent. So all of a sudden, we've taken a pretty steep step forward from that 20 percent to much higher numbers. And that's, that's in melanoma, and so the com combination of two immunotherapies um, looks to be very promising. But I never used the word 100% yet, so we still have more work to do. Um, and so the theory is that we need to combine these immunotherapies with even perhaps other immunotherapies. And Chuck is working on another one called anti-lag-3. Pam is working on agents that push a, uh, an accelerator molecule called ICOS on T cells even harder. And we're looking at how to use other anti-cancer therapies, not forgetting that you need to treat the cancer as well, um, combining with radiation, combining with targeted pathway inhibitors, combining with chemotherapy and hormonal therapy, that is where we're going to make the most impact, especially in diseases other than melanoma, uh, where we have to get the immune system interested in the cancer from the very beginning. Um, and creating a little disruption in that microenvironment that the tumor lives in by stirring it up with some radiation or with some chemotherapy or hormones may be just enough to then allow these immunotherapies to have an even greater impact. When you take um, pancreatic cancer and glioblastoma, the most common uh, brain tumor, and you know that you measure um, for many of these patients, if they can't be cured with surgery, life expectancy in weeks. It's really much more like the 1970s and 60s and 70s in childhood leukemia, mm -hmm. right? Where these children's lives were measured in days um, and where people like Dr. Fry, it's largely lost on our medical students now, but they're in the middle of the Vietnam War, a guy with Elvis Costello glasses this is Tom Fry at the time, stood in front of the Dana-Farber and said, I have, I have basically 12 children who should be dead. But they're all playing around. They're, they're three to five years old, and they've gotten these new medicines, and we think combination chemotherapy is transformational. And the real concept, and really the proof was in the children. And it wasn't that leukemia had been completely conquered, but the signal was deafening. And then every children's hospital in America had their swing into action. And then it became unacceptable for a child in the United States of America with leukemia. One up the street in Ithaca, New York, who was the child of a Cornell professor, missed this by about um, a year. Um, but they had his, they had his uh, portrait up in their living room. There became a moment for leukemia 
childhood leukemia where it was unacceptable for any child in our country or around the world not to get state of science. Do you think, Pam, we've reached that point for melanoma? Absolutely. I think it's unacceptable if we cannot offer a melanoma patient an immunotherapy agent that we know has these kinds of And this is a things. disease that for stage four melanoma is measured in weeks, right? Exactly. Chuck, what do you think the FDA should reposition itself to look for for glioblastoma, for pancreatic cancer, for lung cancer, for breast cancer, for prostate cancer? How do you reset to the Tom Fry era, which is as soon as we can line up enough patients who could not be here unless the medicine was working. What, what do you think that looks like for the FDA now? So it's very interesting actually. So cancer drugs are almost uniformly approved and I think Elliot would agree on overall survival. The problem with these drugs is that overall survival is not a problem, is that overall survival can be really, really good. And so the, the issue is that makes the trials, as Elliot mentioned, take five years, sometimes longer. What about prostate cancer? We're slower growing, it's even longer. What I think we need to think about doing is looking at those curves and moving to a, a paradigm where we look at a milestone. The percentage of patients that are alive at two or three years should be considered as an alternative uh, approval endpoint. And this is what we see in, with anti-PD-1 and kidney cancer. Uh, with the patients who have a response, maybe 20 or 30 percent are alive at three years, which is not seen with the standard therapies, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, chemotherapy kinds of drugs. And so instead of waiting till these patients die, to try to get an idea of what the survival is. I think looking at milestone analysis is really going to be a better way to analyze the benefit. As of the late Tom Fry would say, is looking at how many people are alive, not counting necessarily um, how, many who had, how many funerals there were. Yes. Right. Right. But the, I, I think we should say how uh, the FDA is responding to this. Mm -hmm. to Talk this. about that. because The FDA is responding to, to this era, and um, the FDA goes through cycles on on being concerned about safety or too, too, uh, or too much uh, medicine with too little data out there, and that, that's understandable. There's documented reasons to worry about that, and for the public good to make sure there are options for patients. And we are now in a clear cycle of trying to accelerate the approval of breakthrough medicines. And although there was initial skepticism to this field, and I think understandably so, because so many attempts in immunotherapy had failed in the last many decades, um, and it was counterintuitive. Um, after some initial skepticism, I think we see people going towards more surrogate milestones for approval uh, in, in certain diseases. We see, importantly, the willingness to study experimental agents, multiple experimental agents before approval, and actually that has been something that's been very difficult to do under the reg in the regulatory arena and is a, a challenge. Um, in commercial organizations that are studying uh, different different agents, uh, something that the Melanoma Research Alliance helps accelerate and catalyze, uh, bringing people together that otherwise wouldn't happen. But I am I am optimistic about what the FDA is doing. I am concerned as a citizen about our lack of willingness to fund properly our NIH and the NCI. Uh, but I would be critical also of the priorities uh, of the NCI and not perhaps recognizing this disruptive change quick enough. They think, I think the question should be asked, what more can we do that we've done, for example, with targeted therapy, with genomic therapy? What can we do? It's not either or, but in addition to that, in the area of immuno-oncology, because I think it's going to take a combination and it's going to take some more resources and we need the government to stand up here. Hang on a second. Um, could, could we bring up those pie slides, please? There you go. So in 2012, the, uh, the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease has a very significant 40% of the federal spend, basic, clinical, translational, is committed to no one dying of HIV. And Magic Johnson, I assure you, was at a Dodgers game where my wife and children were recently, and he was 100% terminal ill when he, not diag when he was diagnosed with HIV. We stood around the Mass General Emergency Ward and said, oh, because all we did was see a flood of pneumocystis yeah. HIV. Um, um, and it was disruptive from the bottom up 
mm -hmm. with the patients from the top down. Mm -hmm. And part of the heartbreak of Dallas Buyers Club, for those who've watched it, is that for those of us who were young and going into cancer research and all the rest, part of this was we could have still learned more about how to execute faster, including one of the more interesting aspects um, is that um, we still have a lot to learn about these medicines even after approval. And even before approval, the dosing, actually, of de one of these medicines was making actually these patients more ill. They were cutting the dose themselves. In fact, they were crowdsourcing the solution amongst themselves of the more appropriate doses. Let's go to the National Cancer Institute for a second. Well, today, well, this is, um, if, you have, if you have basically $3.9 billion, and the tsunami was coming in because these patients were showing up and the science is world class and at the beginning of 20, end of 2013, it's the breakthrough of the year in Science Magazine. Um, and for scientists, that's the Wall Street Journal of anything that means anything in science. I mean, this is not, um, this is not just a throwaway. I, I find the scientists still read the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, we, we see actually a, a surprising, a small um, blue piece of the pie even though I'd argue that um, we have more evidence now for immuno-oncology than there was for triple drug therapy for HIV when the inflection point came. Yeah. But just one more slide. You want to just go to the N NCI report? Nope, back, sorry. That's, that's for some science at the end. So if you read the summary of the National Cancer Institute director of the entire National Cancer Institute annual budget, or how the American people is being spent for cancer, you can find in this 83-page document, which are the priorities and the allocations, um, anyone can do it using Adobe and WordFind. You can basically assemble about 0.8 of a full page of anything of immunotherapy for the 83 pages that represent how the American people's money is being spent. So I would like to go down the line pretty briefly, and these are just facts at the Milken Conference. You can quantitate this yourself. Um, let me start with Chuck. So Chuck. Quickly, um, before we open it up for some questions, why? Why is the government so disconnected? Well, I, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a little bit of a different view of how to take care of cancer, what cancer means. For a long period of time, cancer was described, and it still is true, as a genetic disease. And so the NIH has spent that money on a large projects to sequence uh, many, 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 many tumors. So we, we really developed a pretty good understanding of the genetic landscape of the enemy. However, that amount of research has not been um, uh, put forth in understanding our friends, the weapons that we have on our side, that is the immune cells. So it's interesting, if we write a grant to the NIH to sequence a tumor, it's felt to be discovery. But if we write a grant to sequence the T cells that are attacking tumors, that's a fishing expedition and is very unlikely to be funded, quite frankly. And so if I could do what I would like to do, I would like to see the NIH put some <coughs> significant resources into understanding the immune response, the T cells that infiltrate and could potentially be our friends, our soldiers, to attack tumors. And those kinds of fundings, I mean, without folks like the MRA and the Prostate Cancer Foundation, we wouldn't even have the resources to begin to do those studies, frankly. Um, what would you add to that comment about why the disconnect right now between? So I think for a long time, immunotherapy had a bad name in cancer. I mean, you know, we had lots of vaccine trials and these kinds of things that didn't work. And it, there was just no respect for the field in terms of will immunotherapy actually lead to clinical benefit. I do think that Jim Allison's work was paradigm shifting. Instead of giving cytokines or instead of vaccinating with peptides or antigens, he said, you don't have to push on the on switch. You have to take off the off switch to get immunotherapy to work. So that's a paradigm shift, and now we can see clinical benefit. But because we had been in this era of immunotherapy will never work, people then just put it on the back burner. And I think that was an afterthought, that page in that 83-page <laughs> document. It's an afterthought because you automatically hear the word immunotherapy and you say it's not going to work and, and that's that. But I think we've proven now over and over in the clinic that it is working and the fact that they're still not paying attention is very worrisome because we need to educate the next generation of physician scientists who are going to bring the next generation of immunotherapy agents even making cure more and more feasible for all these different tumor types. And if they can't get their NIH grants, they leave. So they're, they're no longer doing this job anymore. And we have lost a, an entire generation of people. And so 
the Melanoma Research Alliance, the PCF, the, these are agencies that have allowed young investigator grants. Those were my first grants, actually. So they allowed me to then compete successfully for the R01s. But if you have to R01s wait... R01s are your tax dollars at work. Exactly. If you have to wait that long to have your tax dollars in the field that's really showing benefit for patients, I think we're in trouble. And so the NCI has to start paying attention and we have to help them. We have to be the ones to sit there and say, this is the time to really help the next generation, the current generation, and all of our patients get the therapy that's really working. Jed, uh, what's your observation, adding to these observations, why the disconnect? And I mean, I, th I think that both uh, Pam and, and Chuck are entirely correct, and I, I think that it's, um, it's a call out for a revision in the way that grants are actually judged. Um, because as many of you may not know, um, when you submit a grant to the National Institutes of Health, it, it gets submitted to a group of your peers. And if there are very few people who are adequately trained and experienced in immunotherapy in the room, then not many people are going to understand exactly what you are proposing, nor the importance, nor the scientific support for that proposal. And then you get labeled with things like being overly ambitious or going on a fishing expedition. Um, because uh, if the person reading your grant doesn't understand the science or recognize the importance, then it is not going to get uh, the type of review that perhaps a, a, a more mainstream grant, one that's not so disruptive, um, is going to get. And so I think it's a reflection of the way the field was for the past numerous decades where nobody was going into this field and that's part of the reason why none of us sleep is because it's, it's just us who really have succeeded through all of these years of, of toiling away trying to legitimize this field. Um, thankfully now, I think we've more been legitimized. You know, I think being called the breakthrough is, is really very important for us. Um, but I think it, it, it's a call out that we need to train people specifically in this area and develop a real group of peers who are not just experts in individual kinds of cancer, but they're experts in how to treat many kinds of cancer with this one approach. Thanks. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, among an enormous number of contributions, really um, led the March of Dimes out of the White House as a private citizen. And as Adlai Stevenson said, she, her philosophy on medical research around polio was it's better to light a candle than curse the darkness. And Elliot, so let's not just talk about the past and the present. Here's a white piece of paper. Yeah. What should happen, and you have more, the joke is, he, we all have had, um, we've been very blessed and we were very hard in different ways, right? But Elliot has the most area under the curve, which is in pharmacology, how much time a drug is in working in a patient. He has the most area on the curve of, of, the, of any of us in a boardroom mm -hmm. where stockholders and these big, I mean, it's essential that biopharma be a part I'll, I'll of. I'll trade you. <laughs> <laughs> with the most so, boardroom experience of any of us, we're, but we're, with, for you to about a white piece of paper, how okay. do we go forward well, with biopharma government foundation? First, we have to be grounded in, 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 how, in somewhat how we got here and what we need to do. It, it is a two sides of a coin. Innovation often occurs at the intersection of different disciplines. And here we have immunology and we have cancer research. And so it shouldn't be surprising. There's just a few people that have tried to bridge those two disciplines that something unexpected might happen or disruptive might happen. The flip side, the other side of the coin, is that we're all schooled in, the di in a certain discipline and we get somewhat siloed thinking. So the new, the new challenge is how do we make sure we have cross-fertilization of this field and total understanding of what the needs are and what the possibilities are? Now, although we've been very uh, optimistic, and I would say most scientists, including these scientists up here, are very reserved about talking in public about cure, but we are now talking about cure yeah, for true. some patients. The challenge is it's not enough patients and enough tumor types. We're probably at the very beginning of this disruptive change, and what we have now in, in clinic is not going to solve the entire problem. There are non-inflammatory tumors, and three of the four largest tumors, like lung, colon, and prostate, are probably non-inflammatory that are going to need something else in order to start this uh, process of unleashing the immune system. 
So what I would like to, to remember is, if you look at history, the patients have always really had the power. And through patient advocacy groups, uh, I think we can have uh, a call to action, a summit, a discussion about where do we stand now? Should we review our priorities? And what needs to be done in these tumor types that might not be accessible, but probably are going to be amenable uh, to future immunotherapy? Um, and I think this is, is quite a challenge. I will say that companies are rapidly doing this in their business plans. If you're in cancer research today in a small company or a large company, in a small company you're all of a sudden an immuno-oncology company. It helps raise money. It's very, very important and there's new things to do. Uh, and grants I'm sure are being rewritten uh, to apply for immunotherapy and I hope they get funded, but good grants are not getting funded today. Uh, but we need that basic research because there's a lot more to do and a lot more to understand. Large companies are either going a different way, perhaps out of cancer, or they're doubling down in cancer and reprioritizing projects at the interface of immunology and oncology. Um, and uh, there's a lot of incentives out there to get this right. Um, so I, I, that's, that's uh, some initial thoughts I have. I mean, Jed, you had some, some thoughts as well Jed? about Well, I think that you, you really hit on a very important point, that there are some cancers that just don't uh, attract the attention of the immune system from, from the beginning. And from some work that, that we did, um, which was uh, supported by MRA, uh, studying uh, immune responses in people's blood that existed before they ever got immunotherapy, we actually found that patients whose immune systems tried to launch an unsuccessful attack against the cancer on their own were actually much better off uh, once they got ipilimumab than patients whose immune systems hadn't even tried. And I think that category of haven't even tried um, applies to many of the patients with the more common cancers that we were discussing. And so now the challenge for us as a field is to figure out how to cause some inflammation, how to cause some immune interest in these other cancers um, at the very beginning so that we can then come in with immunotherapy. The reason uh, Dr. Howard Sewell is just moving some oxygen because this is a central part of the whole future of solving the prostate cancer problem, if it's metastatic disease. Pa Pam and Chuck, can we, can we get to the Jimmy Stewart slide? This is the city of Frank Capra. Thanks. So that, that's Dr. Allison, that's Dr. June. Later we can talk some more about the science, but there's Mr. Smith, but he's now Mr. Global Conference. No, it's too global. He's gone to Washington with a blackboard. Um, but he's got all these partners, and um, the NIH Biopharma, um, and um, of course the, the foundations, which are also the patients. Um, but if one really had a call to action, Chuck, what's one of the prescriptions we would need to fill in the next 120 days for immunotherapy for all, just to push the entire agenda forward for all patients diagnosed with cancers that could kill them? And that's actually, there are actually three, approximately 300 uh, different stem cells in our body. So there are at least 300 different forms of cancer. It never was one disease. Chuck, well, let's write a prescription and then we'll open up to questions. So we'll go right down. So quite honestly, I think that the cancers that are not initially responsive to immunotherapy, to ipilimumab or nivolumab, are the ones where combination therapies will need to be tested. So we need to test combinations. Right. And incent biotech, pharma, um, uh, the NIH. And not only that, though, honestly, I think, I think the one thing is that many of the trials um, are done very differently. If we, um, a, uh, if we um, adopted a more uniform approach where our combination trials could be cross-compared, then we could do multiple combination therapy trials like we do in mice. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the mice, we, do, we have 100 mice. We do this, 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 and this, right? I mean, in patients, we don't really know what combinations will cure prostate cancer. We really don't know. So if we did more combination therapy trials in a systemic way, I think we could get answers sooner, frankly. 
I write another prescription. I Pam. think we have to allow thinking outside the box. I mean, we are not in the chemotherapy world anymore. So people are going around saying, oh, these drugs are toxic. Well, you know, so is chemotherapy. We just know how to handle chemotherapy better. You know, we, we understand the toxicities. These drugs have a different set of toxicities. So we have to be educated and we have to know how to handle them because the benefits outweigh the risk. Thinking outside the box also means that maybe we don't need 800 patients to learn about the biology and the mechanisms. I mean, one of the things that we've really been doing a lot of of MD Anderson that, you know, I started out in my first research project that PCF and MRA thankfully funded because nobody else was going to believe in it, was to do a small 12 patient clinical trial to look at what is the immune response occurring in the tumor tissues. Because if we know what's going on in the tumor tissues, we can start to then ask the question, is that what's going on in the peripheral blood? And those kinds of things, small patient trials that require these kinds of funding to understand. It's thinking outside the box. I think, you know, the, right now the NIH and the NCI and they're all within one box. And I do think it's all about the genetics. How do you sequence and how do you say what mutation is there? Well, the immune system is not just about one thing. It's many, many, many cell types. And we can't just have one piece of information that's going to guide us. So until we start to understand all of the pieces of information within the immune system, it's not one mutation. There's lots of things that a T cell, a B cell, a dendritic cell, an NK cell, a macrophage, all of these parts that make it up. And I don't think that we're thinking about those things yet. I still think we're looking at it's the mutation of the cancer. And so we've forgotten that the immune response is a whole other um, situation. So it's outside the box thinking. Outside the box. And there are a lot of effector cells. Yes. Um, and uh, Chad, what's your prescription? I think we have to figure out how to rapidly fund thinking outside the box <laughs> um, so, that we, so that we can answer these exactly. questions. There's no lack of questions that right. can be answered in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. And I think we've sort of come up with, a, with an outline for how to do that. Mm -hmm. But we need to really uh, do this not in serial, but in parallel. Just like, like Chuck said, with uh, multiple uh, cohorts of willing volunteers to participate in clinical trials treated in a systematic way so comparisons can be made, we can understand what is the best way to move forward, what works, and what doesn't work. Um, we have time for a few questions. Sure. Um, my question to the whole panel will be, uh, is there any role uh, for individual immunoprofiling in order to properly select for the right patients? If so, what do you use in your practice? So, 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 I have, so, so not quite, qu qu quite yet, but I think this is coming along. Um, my, uh, my, my mentor um, and boss, actually, Drew Pardola, has been studying colorectal cancer. Okay? And if you looked at the infiltrate in patients with colorectal cancer, sometimes you see PD-1 and sometimes you see LAG-3. Mm -hmm. Obviously the patients who have PD-1 should be treated with anti-PD-1. Folks that have LAG-3 might be treated with anti-LAG-3 or the combination. So understanding which checkpoints particular tumors are using might be one way to advance that sort of an individualized immunotherapy approach. Any other questions? Do you, uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, are you hopeful that um, applying T-cell car therapy to those tumors. That Can I have the Carl June slide, please? Yeah, <laughs> Carl June, OK. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just Carl June. It's the City of Hope, Movember's it's Yeah, it's, and, and it's Hutchinson, Hutchinson Cancer and the others, too. Yeah, well, there are a whole yeah, bunch, right? But, but can we be hopeful that uh, applying car therapy to those tumors that have not elicited an immune response would be effective? Um, there be unanimous, yeah. yes, we should be hopeful. But I think a question may be for um, Jed, is, yeah. do you think we've already invested in some of the more important questions for CAR therapy? Do you think that's a saturated field for the next 24 months for research? I don't think it's saturated. I think there's, it's a very valid point that we need to combine right. uh, the, right. the, the, these other immunotherapies with the CAR T-cell therapies. Uh, we these are performance enhanced. These are, sorry, there won't be any molecular biology time for the mm -hmm. TCR right. Zeta gene, but <laughs> these are performance enhanced T-cells that are yours that are actually taken out of your body and attack your cancer. Be but thanks to the Human Genome Project and molecular biology and the revolution, we're actually sending back a better T cell than you were born it with. It falls into the category of one way to get the immune system interested right. in right. the cancer before you give drugs right. like right. anti-PD-1 or, or ipilimumab. And it, that's, that's the excitement. Mm -hmm. But so far, the impressive results have come from hematologic diseases. Okay. And we have not seen yeah. uh, a safety profile that's 
encouraging in solid tumors. So there's a great deal of hope and hopefully we can identify the challenge of getting into solid tumors uh, and, and how to do that. But that's one approach of exciting the immune system where uh, the checkpoint inhibitors may or may not work or where they, where, they, where they need to be used in combination. And along that line, we're gonna see smart vaccines, I think, uh, a new generation of vaccines for certain types of cancers that are immune profile to need it. So, Elliot, I wouldn't ask you this question if you weren't already outside of BMS, but <laughs> you, you really hit the nail on the head when you stated that some tumors are not inflammatory. Right. And probably that's why they're not susceptible to checkpoint inhibition. However, um, we have funded, MRA has funded uh, some really good ideas. There's one coming out of Cambridge uh, where the microenvironment downregulates these things. Chuck Drake has ideas about epigenetic modulation yes. of, the, of the tumor. And the trials, we're, we're talking, we're going back now, Chuck, what, three, four years. This guy has been unable to get the medicines, unable to get the protocols approved by the companies that have these precious assets that could be treating yeah, patients how, why today. Is that, so Ellie? why is that, Elliot? <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't work so the drugs, <laughs> if you think of Dallas Buyers Club, what, what, what's going on there? It's a combination of factors. When you have an experimental agent um, that you're, and you have already the science in front of you that says you have to execute on a development program for the benefit of a huge number of patients, you do all you can in a very directed fashion to get that drug approved. Uh, it is very difficult to fund as a company or to take some risk with the molecule to fund all the research you'd like to see funded. But I see that happening more and more, that I think the companies that are invested in this area are making the drug available, but sometimes it's needed for the clinical supply of exactly, uh, uh, of the exact purpose in front of it, because you, you may assume that certain drugs are gonna be approved. Until they're approved, I never assume they're gonna be approved. <laughs> and I think that's the most important obligation to the patients and to the company. Well, there's a very nice lady in the back that says session over. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the, uh, the cancer problem has everybody fairly riveted looking around the room. Um, we'd be happy to visit with people with questions, I think, for a while, probably in the hall, right? Because mm -hmm. they're going to need yeah. the room. Is that fair? No, no, no. no we can stay? Yeah. Um, so for those who need to go to the next um, session, what are fine, but so I think you got a pretty energetic panel. We just keep answering questions for a while if that's all right. So um, thank you. Th but thanks for attending.